The first reading is from the 73rd Psalm, verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Our second reading today is from the Gospel according to St. Mark. And this is early on in Jesus' ministry. It's in the third chapter. And we read beginning in verse 1. Again, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue. And a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. O oh God, on this sacred last day of the church year, we come before you and we look back at all of your blessings, all of the people you placed in our lives, some who have gone on to be with you in eternity. So we ask you, O oh God, that as we survey your goodness throughout this year, that you would fill us with hope for the future. Give us what we need. Equip us with the skills that we need to do what you've called us to do in this world during our lives. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, on this day uh, in worship every year, we remember and we honor those in our church family who passed on from this world during the year to their eternal heavenly reward. And so we grieve. We grieve because we miss them. We miss their presence in our lives. You know, change in many of its forms in this world can cause varying forms of, of grief because change almost always involves the loss of something that was there as a new reality. Whatever it is, is coming into being. And if in that change we lose something really meaningful to us, like someone we love. Well, that hurts. And sometimes we wish we could just kind of reach inside of ourselves and somehow pull out the grief, you know, so we could just move on with our lives, like a doctor would remove a tumor or something else that was causing us pain. We just want to remove that grief, that feeling of, of loss, that, that emptiness. But moving beyond grief is much more like the process of healing that our body goes through after surgery than it is like a surgery itself that removes something. And grief, in fact, is what we call the process of emotional and spiritual healing after experiencing a traumatic loss. Grief is how we learn to adjust to that change in our lives and everything that that entails. And like most processes, that usually takes time. Now psychologists tell us that there are different stages of grief, but theories differ as to what those specific stages are and how people move through them and 
how long it takes. So as with too many things, researchers also can't all agree with each other uh, when it comes to grief, which really isn't much of a surprise because I suspect that just as each of us is unique, so also the way each of us grieves is unique. You know, there are certainly similarities between people, but there are also differences. And as long as we're not hurting ourselves or others in the process, no one should feel it's wrong if their journey toward healing from loss looks different from somebody else's. You know, if you feel that eating bananas while watching reruns of the Brady Bunch once a week is a necessary part of gaining the strength you need as you're going through a healing process, then do it. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. The only important thing is that we're on a journey toward healing. That we're engaged somehow with others' help when needed. Maybe even professional help in the challenging work of reaching that destination. Because if we don't try to heal, there are times, many times, when we won't heal. We'll get stuck in our grief. Maybe for a very long time. And I know that sounds depressing, but honestly, it's, it's one of the reasons why people feel miserable in life when there isn't anything presently causing their misery. It's because they never healed from loss they experienced before. So that loss, you know, it, it's nasty residue kind of hangs around, continuing to tinker with their lives, causing more problems than might have otherwise existed. Now some will say that time itself heals grief. Just give it time. Alone, that's all you need. But I've mentioned before that I don't believe that. I've met people whose wounds are just as fresh 50 years after a loss as they were the day that it happened. Because everyone needs to work somehow on healing after a trauma. You can't just bury it or let it go. Everyone needs to work. For even though after we heal from our grief, there might be some pain that remains, just as big wounds many times leave scars even after they heal. Overall, if we've done the hard work of moving through a grief process, our own unique grief process, we'll end up in a much better place than we were. So I guess the most important question to ask about grieving is, how can we be sure that what we're doing during our grief process is helping us heal? How can we be sure we're moving toward that place we want to be in the future? And that's where I think scripture can help us out quite a bit, in particular, by looking at Jesus himself. Because the Gospels tell us in several places, very explicitly, that our Lord grieved. He grieved at moments during his life when, like all of us, he experienced loss. And if we pay attention to the way that he did it, it can give us some guidance. And one of those passages is our reading today from St. Mark's Gospel, where Jesus demonstrates that it is so important that part of our process of healing from grief involves somehow our commitment to be a healing presence in the lives of others who are also struggling with loss. In our passage, Jesus, he enters a synagogue, which, remember, uh, in his day was a gathering of Jews, either in a building or outdoors for worship and prayer. 
on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. And uh, there, Jesus, he heals a man with a disfigured hand, is what our Bibles, how our Bibles put it. And the Greek word used to describe this man's health problem literally meant dried up or wasted away. So he was unable to use one of his hands. So the biggest issue that this man would have faced in his ancient agrarian society would have been the difficulty he would have faced doing some forms of physical labor. Something that would have impacted his ability to provide for his family, which was a big loss in a society where everybody's just scraping by and you need everybody in the household who can as much as possible uh, to work, to do everything they can. So this miracle Jesus performs in this man's life, it seems like an all-around good thing. Well, you'd think that everybody in the synagogue would have been elated for this guy. You know, by St. Mark's account, this miracle took place early on in Jesus' ministry, even before he officially appointed his 12 disciples. So you'd think it would have moved everybody so deeply that they all would have, you know, jumped on the Jesus bandwagon. They all would have joined his ministry. Instead, though, we're told in verse 2 that before Jesus even performs the miracle, some in the worship gathering itself, uh, who were corrupt leaders that were told earlier, corrupt leaders posing in a sense in their religious positions but interested only in politics. They were observing Jesus scrupulously, the Greek text literally says, and they were doing this to determine whether Jesus healed somebody so that they could, the Greek text literally says, bring formal legal criminal charges against him. So, at this point in our story, you know, we are immediately transported right into the middle of Wacky Town, right downtown in the middle of the square, where someone is at risk of facing criminal charges for healing somebody else. I mean, that's like throwing Captain Kangaroo in jail for making kids laugh. I mean, uh, what in the world is going on in this story? And what's worse is that Jesus actually expects this treatment. He says in verse 4, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? So, what's wrong with these people who are criticizing Jesus? Well, you know, I've I've mentioned before when we've explored stories that are similar to this, that in order for us to understand, we have to understand the Sabbath and how important that was in Jesus' society. You know, Israelite law dictated that people do no work at all on the Sabbath. In fact, God is quoted in verse 8 of the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, is saying, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day you shall not do any work. Not a whole lot of wiggle room there. Because remember, God, through this rule, was protecting people from a very common problem throughout the ancient world, which was literally being worked to death. You know, you're, you're sick, you feel a sharp pain in your chest, your left leg just fell off, get back to work, I don't care. Uh, that was the status quo for most people in most ancient societies. And the Sabbath was this really innovative, progressive thing in Israelite society that protected people from that kind of 
horrible mistreatment. And since in Jesus' day the Jews were occupied by uh, another power, the Romans, strict adherence to the Sabbath was even more important because there were many Roman officials who would have loved to have worked their Jewish subjects to death so they could get as much out of them as possible. So Sabbath laws were important. In fact, I've mentioned before that today in our always on seven days a week work till you drop culture, we ourselves could learn something very valuable from the wisdom of the Sabbath. But these leaders in the synagogue in our story, what's so insidious about what they were doing is they were taking this really good rule that protected so many people's lives and they were misapplying it. They were misapplying it in a way that was hurting people. See, the norm was that you did no work on the Sabbath unless you were saving someone's life who was in imminent risk of death. So, from their perspective, you know, looking down from their ivory towers, uh, this man who had the disfigured hand, well, that's not a life-threatening injury. He doesn't need to be healed on the Sabbath. Jesus, we've got you now. You're doing something that is illegal. The members of that man's family, however, some of whom may have been starving because he couldn't work, would likely have disagreed that his you know, hand being healed was, was not a, a necessary life-threatening uh, thing. It needed to happen, and that's not to mention everyone else in the synagogue whose spirits would have been lifted by Jesus' act. I mean, it would have been horrible living in Roman society as many of these subjects in, in Jesus' society who had no rights. How many people then would have been driven to, to madness, driven even to take their own lives by the weight of living under such oppression? And that's also a life-threatening situation. So in addition to blessing that man, Jesus' miracle would have also sent everybody in the room that day the message that God has not left you. God cares for you. With God, there is hope. And this is why we're told in verse 5 that before Jesus performs this miracle, he stops. You know, knowing that these people are scrutinizing what he's about to do, he he stops and he and he looks around at you know these these numbskulls who are criticizing him and and he's angry. You know, Jesus is angry, and the text adds that he was grieved. A very strong word in the Greek. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus could see what they were doing. He could see how they were taking something meant to preserve life and using it in this instance to destroy someone's life. And that created in our Lord a great loss. A loss that he grieved. But how then did Jesus respond to his grief? Did he leave the synagogue discouraged about what had happened? You know, and go off into another place, leaving the man, you know, to deal with his issue because he was so overwhelmed with his grief. Did he just stuff it down inside and, you know, yell at Peter and his disciples the next day about something that really wasn't an issue, taking his anger out on somebody else because he didn't work through it himself in a, in a healthy way? How did our Lord deal with his grief? What's the first thing that he does? In verse 5, Jesus, probably looking at those corrupt leaders in the eyes as he did it, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man stretched it out, and his hand was restored. 
So how did our Lord, not only in this instance, but in virtually every instance that we see in this gospel when our Lord grieves, how did he respond from the depths of his own grief? He became a healing presence in the lives of others who were also experiencing loss. Now, that certainly didn't solve all of Jesus' problems. You know, we read in verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired how to destroy him. I mean, what a lovely thing to do during coffee hour, right after worship. You know, conspire how to destroy the person who healed somebody. But regardless, Jesus, the man with the disfigured hand, and all the other good people in that synagogue that day, they were in a better place. Everyone's hearts were lifted. And Jesus went on to fulfill his ministry in spite of the loss that he experienced. And he serves as a great example to us, as I said. You know, the grief process, it does look different for each of us in certain ways. But as we're doing the important work of looking inside of ourselves to examine our own hearts, it's also important that we include in our process, like our Lord did, the opportunities that we take to show God's compassion and love to others. It's important that we, even in our wounded condition, that we imagine how we might be a healing presence to others. Because it's amazing. We might think we have very little to give. We might feel an emptiness that's so big that it's paralyzing. But if we can do that and look beyond ourselves, God will work powerfully through that. He'll give us more than we ever realized that we had to give. That journey won't eliminate pain completely from ours and others' lives, but we'll all be a lot better off in the end. It says the psalmist says in our Psalter reading that Tony read for us today about his experience of God's grace when he says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's amazing in the kingdom of God. When you're empty, you've got more to give than you oftentimes realize because of God's spirit that fills us. So Jesus' response to his own grief today challenges us to ask ourselves, when I experience loss, will I make blessing others a part of my healing process? Will I invite God's spirit into my grief process in that way? May God bless all of us who have lost loved ones as we reflect upon this. And may God bless all of us, regardless of what loss we experience in our lives. Amen.